You know that feeling deep in your solar plexus, like a tight fist crushing a hot piece of charcoal? No, I'm not talking about acid reflux. I'm talking about the anger that boils within after you read something crazy or harmful or racist online. And you say to yourself, I just cannot let this one go. I have to respond. Well, I've got some bad news. That cycle, read, anger, response, is exactly what many on the online right in particular want to happen. It's intention. There's even a name for the entire process. It's called rage farming. And I, like many of you at home, have often fallen victim to it. Just last week, the official Texas GOP Twitter account posted this photo saying, if you can wait in line for hours for testing, you can wait in line to vote. My thumbs were already poised above my phone's keyboard, ready to dunk on them for such a lazy, dangerously false equivalency. The tweet from the Texas GOP went viral. And it prompted the Texas GOP account to post more inflammatory tweets. One gloated about how mad they made the pronouns in bio people. Another taunted that masks are dumb in a clear attempt to keep poking the liberal bear. And the response was pretty much what you would expect. Anger from the left poured in, which the trolls reveled in, asking liberals to cry more and continue to boost those posts, to drive up traffic and clicks to their account, to make the Texas GOP more visible than it has any right being. I hate that I'm talking about them right now, but I fear we've all done it. I played right into it myself, responding with my own snarky quote tweet. But was it an error on my part? A question I asked myself after reading a piece from journalist Molly Jongfast in The Atlantic, which uses this exact Texas tweet, this example from the Texas GOP, to illustrate the phenomenon of what one of her interviewees, John Scott Railton, calls rage farming. Another expert quoted in the piece, Professor Sam Woolley, explains the trick for these accounts, like Texas GOP, is to harness the energy of other users in order to get their own ideas or accounts to trend. They often use manipulative tactics in order to get people to respond, just so long as they're actually engaging with the message. If you can get enough people, it doesn't matter how they're engaging, your message is going to go viral. The article goes on to point out that this quote-unquote farmed rage equals fundraising dollars often. Researcher Scott Railton alerted liberals that their angry quote tweets were an engagement win for trolls. Coming up with a clever thought experiment to illustrate just how powerful a tactic it is, he said, think of three recent outrageous things done by rage farming politicians. Now, how about three recent policy moves by the Biden administration, which took more effort? All right, point taken. But where do we draw the line? Will the right's rage farm fields really dry up if we just ignore their outrageous trolling? Or will they flourish with no one to shine a light on their bad behavior and hold them to account? And as a journalist in particular, what is the best way to react to the crazy and offensive stuff that comes out of the mouths of Donald Trump, Marjorie Taylor Greene and co? Joining me now to discuss all of this, journalist Molly Jongfast, who wrote the article about rage farming for The Atlantic. She's also editor-at-large for The Daily Beast. And John Scott Railton, a senior researcher at the Citizen Lab, who coined the term rage farming on Twitter. Thank you both for joining me this evening. Uh, Molly, how do we hold bad actors responsible for their actions without spreading their message or helping them get a bigger profile? Where is the line? Well, it's a hard question. I'm not one of those people who believes that you should ignore Trump or ignore these people because they're really dangerous. And if you ignore them, it doesn't prevent them from go from existing. But in the same sense, you have to, you know, engagement is what they want. So even just taking a screen cap is one way to lessen their engagement. And I mean, I think how we got here was that the algorithms were, are not, you know, there's so much mystery around the algorithms that this group has figured out that they're going to use, they're gonna use it in any way they can. And so they've figured out that it, it, engagement, positive or negative, it doesn't matter. But Molly, you and I are Twitter addicts. We love being <laughs> online. We love dunking on the dunderheads. Uh, today, I just thought I'll check your Twitter account because you're coming on the show. I saw a clip <laughs> and I just seen a clip of Marjorie Taylor Greene doing the rounds on Twitter, her claiming that the line Jewish space lasers referring to her conspiracy theory about a Jewish billionaire causing wildfires with a laser beam. She said it offends her. 
It really bothers, it hurts her feelings. And I almost responded, I thought, nope, I'm not going to amplify Marjorie Taylor Greene. But then I didn't, and then I noticed you did. You said it hurt my feelings because I'm Jewish, but I thought it was a great dunk. Was that a mistake right. in hindsight? Should we be trying to reduce Marjorie Taylor Greene's profile online or not? It is a genuine dilemma for me. Right. No, it's a genuine dilemma for everyone. And I think we always have to be very smart about what we do and where we put our attention. Someone like Marjorie Taylor Greene has done very well with using these kind of this kind of drama for small dollar donations. So I think that's a good point. That said, I feel like the people who follow me are more on the left and they're not going to be donating to Marjorie Taylor Greene anytime soon. <laughs> so I think that pointing out her inconsistencies and also the racism and the dangerous Islamophobia. Yes. I mean, I, I think someone like this is really, I mean, remember Steve King was taken off his committee assignments because people yeah. noticed what he was. So I, I think it's hard. It's a very tough situation. Yeah, uh, John, you're the expert on this. You're the man who talked about rage farming. Tell us what we should be doing differently. Tell Molly and I how we should navigate this perilous world of online dunking and rage farming and quote tweeting. What should we do? I feel like I'm sitting in a support session, but I have a confession uh, to we make, need which support. is uh, that, that tweet that I did, um, that was my better angel speaking to me because I had an excellent <laughs> dunk set up for that GOP thing, and I was just <laughs> ready to fire it. And I think this herein lies the problem, which is we've gotten better at uh, communicating to what we feel is our audience about this kind of thing and why it's problematic, highlighting it and trying to understand that this isn't the world that we want to live in. But the problem is that fact of our engagement itself pays dividends for the original content source. Now, Molly mentioned, for example, screen capturing it. That's a great uh, approach that you can take in part because then you're not rewarding the account that is pushing it directly with those engagement numbers. But at the same time, you're still surfacing the content Realistically, I think we yes. all struggle with this problem. I think I do too. One thing that I would suggest people is if you're going to bring out something that's really upsetting and inflammatory and you just have a really excellent dunk and you need to share it with your followers, consider also adding an action that they can take. Something that people mm. can do off of that moment and emotion. I thought you were going to say consider going to bed on it. That's what I've done occasionally. I've written a really, really outrageous tweet, and then I've just gone to bed. In the morning, I feel bad. I don't need to post I it. I think but we just have to on... be pragmatic about this situation. It's really yeah. hard to resist these things. It's well, like cigarettes. Well, if we're going to be pragmatic, it, not... John, if we're going to be pragmatic, I'll just be very realistic. One of the reasons I don't do the screen capping, even though I totally understand where you're coming from, is it takes time. The whole point of social media is quick. I'm not going to sit there and take a picture and then edit. That's a problem for a lot of people. I'm just, I'm, just being, I'm just being real. But, John, you made a good point about you don't reward the account, but by sharing a screen cap, you're still rewarding the message or the content, whether it's bigoted, whether it's crazy, whether it's anti-vaxxer. Yeah. We're, we're still in that. We're still back to square one, which is do we want to amplify the message uh, and help it along, even if we're condemning it along the way? Or do we just want to suppress exactly. the message and hope it doesn't go viral? And I think one of the challenges that we all have is that we all, at the end of the day, no matter how big Twitter addicts we are, we have a finite quorum of feelings that we can feel in any given 24-hour period. And the same is true for all of our followers. And I think if we're going to spend some of that collective feeling capital, getting angry about things, we should at least try to translate that feeling into some kind of a positive action that people can Very take. Otherwise, we just finish the day on empty calories of rage and mm -hmm. anger, and we're no better for it. Um, Molly, Donald Trump, who is the ur-troll, the uber-troll, the king-troll, he held a rally uh, in Arizona this past weekend. And there's, you know and I know, since he left office, there's been a big debate about how do you cover Trump in self-exile in Mar-a-Lago? Mm -hmm. How do you cover Trump if he runs for president again? This rally is kind of a kind of uh, soft launch of, some would argue, of, of that campaign. What is the standard of newsiness that Trump has to meet in order to get covered. And we have this, this, you know, I had a show on Sunday on MSNBC. How much do we cover the Trump rally? My producers and I had that conversation. We had the same conversation on Monday with the producers of this show. A lot of people get very upset at home and say, why are you covering Trump? Don't give him oxygen. It's not as if we're lax about this. I mean, some journalists might be, but I'm sure you and I are not. 
where, again, where do you draw the line with someone like Trump? Because he's the former president. He may be the next president. What he says is inherently newsy, even if it is crazy or offensive. You have to cover Trump. I mean, there's no way you can avoid it. The man is just too important. And I wish he weren't. And I wish that this wasn't the case. But he is, uh, you know, he's really the Republican Party at this point. And if you don't cover it, it's like, Media malfeasance. What I, I mean, I would you say cover that, it, Molly. How? How do you yeah, cover Trump? I, I guess mean, that is a follow-up. I think you have to do a truth sandwich. You have to say what the truth is. Then you let Trump. You put in Trump's little lie, and then you say on the other side, everyone knows this isn't true. We have it proven. Da 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 da. I mean, you just have to be so careful with every Trump lie and debunk, 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 debunk. And I guess then, I mean, look. The good news is your audience is not, you know, you are not pushing disinformation to your audience because you're being so careful. But yeah, it's a real conundrum. And I think it's 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 going to be something we're going to have to deal with for the next couple of years. Uh, it is. Yes, definitely. And, and John, one question to you. People like Trump and Marjorie Taylor Greene, and there's a, whole, there's a whole generation of Republican politicians now that exists just to own the libs and troll people and say, cry more. I mean, Madison Cawthorn, when he was elected, he literally tweeted, cry more libs, uh, was his line on election night or the day after, if memory serves me correctly. Um, how much do they know what they're doing? Like, how, <laughs> we've called them crazy and dumb and ignorant, but how smart are they? How, how coordinated is this stuff when they're putting out these tweets, when the Texas GOP is doing what it's doing? How strategic is that, do you believe? Well, in the immortal words of Marco Rubio, I think they know exactly what they're doing. I have a little theory, which is that some of these politicians are actually the sort of like secret um, professional wrestling indulgence of liberals. And they play to their audience, which in many cases is also us, and we reward them with anger, just like the character in pro wrestling who everyone kind of loves to hate. I think people, in some cases, they coordinate this messaging, but literally the internet is a giant laboratory for marketing things. And what they're marketing is a set of ideas. And they're trying to get people down a certain path of action that will result in things that work for them things like engagement and amplifying their message and making them seem like they are way more important than their, you know, very limited policy actions ever will be. And I think that this is the problem that we as liberals face, which is we look at groups like this, we look at people like this. It's not that we're looking at a giant conspiracy, but it is one by one, people are figuring out and tasting the engagement power that they can create. And many of them are honing their message. We saw it with the Texas GOP. They tried it. It landed really well. And so they went on and did it again and again and again until eventually people saturated. Yeah. But I think so many characters like uh, MTG and others are exactly doing that, right? No doubt her tweets today were probably partly designed in order to get those dunks, in order to get people mm -hmm. angry. Hi, I'm Mehdi Hassan. Thanks for checking out our channel on YouTube. You can see more of the Mehdi Hassan show by clicking on any of the videos on this screen and make sure you subscribe below to stay up to date on the day's biggest stories. Thank you for watching.